So welcome to this session of innovating on fiscal transparency with digital tools. This is a very different session than yesterday. The point here is to provide us with, with time to look at one of the tools that you're working on and ask the real questions, the difficult questions, the implementation questions that anyone might have. So we want to go in depth on um, the things that, that you're working on in, in this regard, only digital tools for fiscal transparency. This is a hot topic for the network. I, we have been seeing this uh, as, a, as a, one of the most important topics for a while, for a couple of years now. And I didn't think that we would see it on the top of the survey anymore. But we did, it was a, just the second after public participation. So there is still a lot of interest on how to evolve on fiscal transparency with digital tools um, around the world. So this, this was a hot topic in all the regions. So I am very happy to have you here. As I mentioned in my email, we have a, two sessions on this topic. So the first session was yesterday. Um, it was in, in Spanish for mainly for our, our participants of Latin America and today in English. So this is more than a language thing or a regional thing, a time zone thing. So we're having, um, since we have enough tools to present, um, we have uh, these two sessions. So. First of all, I want to introduce you to the things that were presented yesterday because I think they were very interesting. Some of you might not know all the tools that were uh, presented yesterday. So I am going on to this. So first off, we had a presentations of simulations and budget games. So open uh, the Office of Planning and Budget of Uruguay presented their budget literacy games. They are, they have had this one that you have on screen for a while now, and they have a very important um, strategy for budget literacy, mainly in elementary and middle schools. So this is an important topic for them. And now with the pandemic, they, they had to change their, um, their perspective and the, the way they're uh, introducing this budget game. So now they're working on different uh, uh, subletters, crosswords, et cetera, that will be soon launched. They show them, but they are still on testing. So we don't have uh, a link to share those. But uh, here is Uruguay. Um, from CEP, civil society from Mexico, they introduced this uh, tobacco taxes simulator. CEP has a long uh, experience on doing uh, simulators for budget, but also for revenues. And this one, uh, it's, they're trying to make it easier to use, to appeal more to the citizens and to, uh, to get the users to communicate their findings. So here, uh, as you can see, you can you can uh, share, you can um, you can change what you suggest um, regarding the tobacco tax, and this creates your infographic. Then then you can share. So this one will be launched in the next couple of weeks. So there you can see it. There's the link. Uh, budget Monitor of Argentina, they have been working this from civil society ASIC uh, for a while now. This is not the, the first version of the Budget Monitor and they're working on a new version. So here people can check uh, the budget uh, allocations with the data that is being released by the Ministry of Finance. That is quite a lot. Um, and they have included this uh, already uh, the data in real terms because in Argentina inflation is very high so that's a big topic and they are facilitating this for journalists. They are pairing the budget monitor with trainings for civil society particularly on the gender topic and they will be presenting on Friday 
their trainings they're doing on how to use the data for gender-based violence so don't miss that one it's a very good initiative i have to say and the next one and here we have gustavo marino he could uh, discuss about this uh, later on and if you have any questions uh, their fiscal transparency portal has a lot of innovations he he, he was showing uh, different aspects of their fiscal transparency portal i chose uh, just this one for <laughs> for timing uh, purposes and this is the notification so any user can subscribe to notifications of any changes in the budget so in in argentina it's not like in other places that you are uh, passing a supplementary budget but any uh, changes in the budget you might get a notification so maybe you're interested in a particular program that is affected by well, that would be very useful right now by COVID and you get a notification if your program might have been um, affected with less resources for a redistribution to, let's say, help. So you might see that here and you might get notifications. Uh, you can see the link here and um, Gustavo, a while ago, he shared with us also the documentation of how this was done. So it's a very good initiative. And finally, uh, the intelligent platform of government grants. So the point of this platform is that anyone can uh, check if there is any grant that could apply to them. Let's say you're an agriculture and want support on fertilizers. Here you can check if there's something for you and what are the rules to get it. Uh, this platform is the innovation on this one is that it's um, has natural language processing so uh, it has some machine learning tools to help bridge the gap between technical language and what the user asks so these are our innovations from yesterday and uh, in a broader sense uh, as part of the governance uh, also CAF showed the GovTech index of 2020 and about the uh, GovTech governance ecosystem but he's gonna uh, share it with you uh, here today so i won't go into this one so our lineup for today we are we have very interesting presentations so again so first we have a uh, prudence from the national treasury of south africa she will be presenting the lake Amali infrastructure platform we have a um, Fernando, but I will leave Fernando at the end of this block since uh, he's having a bit of difficulties. Uh, Fernando, he's from the Treasury of Brazil. They have very interesting innovations in the use of data. We have Claire Bautista from the Department of Budget and Management of the Philippines. And we have Sukis Wakota uh, showing the procurement guide of Bule Kamali. After each of these blocks, we will have a chance for questions and answers. So go ahead and ask all the questions that, uh, the difficult questions uh, that you wanna ask. This is the point of this session. This is a closed session, not a webinar. That's why, so that you can ask the difficult questions to any of these presenters. And then we have the enabling fiscal openness through GovTech with Enrique Zapata. We will have time for questions and answers. And then we ha will have, uh, different broader focus on open data. Um, Felipe Zapata from the Open Government Data Initiative from the OECD will be presenting um, some, some part of uh, the fiscal data governance. And Omar Guerrero from the Alan Turing Institute will share with us the use of fiscal data for achieving the SDGs. Um, he has a very interesting analysis on uh, machine learning with machine learning for um, policy priorities. So he will talk about this. Um, as you can see, these are uh, many presentations. And yes, uh, someone's, uh, some of the presenters are asking if I should share the presentations please go ahead and share your screen. Don't worry if you uh, have any difficulty, let me know and I can, and I can do that for you. Um, 
each of you will have five minutes to present. And as I, as the same as I told you yesterday, uh, for, for the ones who were in the session yesterday, I am less lenient than Juan Pablo on the timing. So I will be uh, timing you and you will only have your five minutes. When your five minutes are up, you will start hearing the music of the Oscars. So if you want your Oscar, uh, please keep it short. We want to ask you a lot of questions. So, um, so first up, and I think Prudence, you're ready, right? Uh, so Prudence, you go first. Hi, Jim. Oh, Prudence, I think we are having some issue with your microphone, with your audio. Um, I'll just take it down if the bandwidth is that. Prudence, I will turn off your video to see if it works better. Am I not audible? I'm t I turned off your video. Okay. Let me know if it's better. Yeah, it's much better. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Do you want me to share the Bulegamali infrastructure platform for you so that you can you hear me better now? Yeah, much better. Okay. All right. I will share my screen. Okay. All right. No, Lauren, I think I'll share my screen. Are you able to, Prudence? So sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I reconnected. Okay, okay. Hopefully this time it won't give us any problems. Good afternoon, good morning to others and good evening to other people. And I will be taking you through the Vulega Mali platform. From my slides, I wanted to just brag a little bit. Yesterday, I saw that the Philippines are talking about how their yeah, OBI is scoring us high. And I thought, okay, maybe it's a platform for sharing good news. So as you may or may not know, we are ranked first in the world alongside New Zealand on the open budget survey. I wish I could say this is because of our digital tools, but I think it's mainly because of previous work that we have been doing um, in terms of our sharing of budget information. And we're hoping that through this platform, Vulega Mali will be able to improve our scoring when it comes to public participation. So as you know, we are part of the Open Government Partnership. We are the founding members and we are also stewards of gift. And uh, this transparency and participation and just sharing information is something that is entrenched in our constitution. So it is not something that we do because it is it nice to have, but rather we have a constitutional obligation um, but we have not yet seen the results of sharing this information in terms of the literacy, the budget literacy around our schools, um, even the general public, because the information is available, but the use thereof is very limited. The slide that you're seeing now is about the latest developments on the portal itself. Um, I will just be focusing on infrastructure, as Lorena said, and the geospatial info. Um, I'm clicking the link now. Hopefully, you can still see my screen. On the 
link that I selected, it shows you projects that are mainly for public-private partnerships. This is infrastructure data, which was not necessarily for a specific grant like all the other infrastructures, but rather it is a partnership between the public sector and the private sector in terms of the projects that are being done. You'll see the name of the project, the total cost of the project, the feasibility stages of that particular project. I'm gonna go very, very fast so that- um, One second, uh, should we be seeing your, your uh, navigation screen? Yeah, you can. Because we're, we're seeing your slides. <laughs> okay. New share then, okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, sorry about that. Can you see my my screen now? We can now, thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Um, okay, now I'm left with three minutes. <laughs> So on the private-public partnerships, as I was saying, it is basically meant to show another layer of projects which you would not necessarily get from our budget documentation, which is on uh, public-private partnerships. You will see the stage of the project, uh, like this one, you'll see the department, water and sanitation, and you'll see what province it's in. So if it's in KZN, you'll see it on the little map here. It will show you the total budget of that project. And you also see here if it's on construction stage and you see the name of the department. So it gives you an overview of what stages these projects are in, which is something that was welcomed by many people. Um, now I'm gonna go back. To, please let me know when you lose me in any given state. And then if you want to go to other projects besides the public-private partnerships, you just come to government department projects. It doesn't mean that the PPPs are not government projects. I think it was easier to reference them this way. And this is what we are linking to a system that the Intergovernmental Relations Unit of the National Treasury had data on. It's called the IRM system. And here you are able to see all the different provinces. You're able to see the different sectors. You're able to see the departments. So if I wanted to see uh, all the health department projects, you can just see on the map, it shows you the locations, it shows you the number of these projects, the project names. Um, if I wanted to filter by project status, I'm able to do that. So you're able to see whether or not the project is a tender stage, construction stage, and it gives you the number of such projects. So now I selected construction stage. So it shows you that there is 83 projects under the health sector for those um, for, for, for at construction stage. But you can also get more details on a particular project of interest to you. You are able to see which program is funding it, the projected status, the program it's under, implementing agent, the city is under, so it's a work in progress, but that is the kind of information you're able to see. Last thing on the latest developments that we have, I see I'm left, I'm, I'm left with very little time now. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to go back. Okay, I seem to be frozen here. The last thing I wanted us to look at is about is on the geospatial information. So this is basically on a um, is that my music? <laughs> okay, Loreda. Super fast. Super fast. Go ahead. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> I go ahead and just finish off here. Go ahead, uh, Prudence. Uh, super fast since yeah, you have yeah, some technical fact. difficulties. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Prudence. Um, yeah. yeah. This is a very exciting platform. Uh, I know it gave you a lot of work, so we are very glad to see it happening uh, now. Um, 
so yeah. this is all the way to facilities this is very good yes yes so this is just basically last thing i wanted to show you is that we have locations on the map of the different schools that we have around the country so this is something that is really exciting for us so you basically have a geographic representation of the data that you want to look at we can even look at the revenue that they have so according to the equitable share this is exciting stuff for us we are not where we want to be yet but we are really happy with the progress and we've received a lot of pro of positive feedback on it. So yeah, that is what Vulekamali is looking like now. And yeah, we're happy to share with anyone you. if you have any questions. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you, Prudence. And I think this will fit uh, as well. It has something to do with uh, what Fernando will be showing as well. It has to do with uh, something of this. So, now, um, Claire, Claire, you're next. Uh, thank you very much, Prudence. Um, so now we go all the way to the Philippines to see what they are doing. Claire, do you hear me? Yes, um, if my email was um, received already, I'm having this internet um, problem connection with my... Oh. Okay. Having problem with my connection, but I actually just emailed my presentation. Okay, let me okay. check if I have it already. Uh, you sent it to me or to Albertina? To me, right? I'm sorry, I sent it to Albertina. Oh, Albertina. I didn't receive it. I didn't receive it yet. Oh, okay, just I just received it, so uh, I can share so, the screen. Thank you, Albert. Just please guide me. Um, thank you. Guide me on yeah, this. Yes, sure. This is a really show. short presentation. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Uh, just a second. So I'm down to four minutes now. <laughs> no, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll start when when we're able to get you on this. Screen. As soon as no, it's okay, it's, it's a pretty short presentation. There we go. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is fiscal transparency in the Philippines. So the next slide shows us um, as I was presented earlier. Um, I mean, the first presenter um, did say that they scored high in the open budget survey and we, I am here to also tell you about the 2019 OBS score that we secured um, out of the 117 countries. We secured the top spot in Southeast Asia, which makes the Philippines the most fiscally transparent country in the region while ranking 10th place worldwide or 10th in the world. The country was able to make budget information publicly available in a comprehensive in timely manner through the publication of all eight key budget documents such as the enacted budget and the citizens budget among others for the 2019 obs actually we secured a higher score from the previous obs due to the publication of the midterm review in a timely manner and the increase in information in the enacted budget as well as the addition of the executive summary in the audit report as we can see in the next slide the in 2019, we were able to uh, have these documents public, uh, publicly available. And on the next slide, we see that disclosure of information covers um, one, the transparency seal, um, where um, agencies are expected to publish in their respective website um, information on their mandate, their functions, the officials, their contact details, annual reports, approved budgets, their major programs and projects, the status of implementation, the annual procurement plan, their contracts and contractors, among others. Um, the full public disclosure policy, on the other hand, is um, or requires local governments to fully disclose particular financial documents 
for their constituents to know how they are spending their budgets. Um, due to the difficulty of some of the local governments in the Philippines in, in uploading their data, um, the Department of the Interior and local government was able to come up with the F, uh, full disclosure portal where LGUs can then upload their financial documents as required. So this consists of their annual budget, their um, annual procurement plans, their receipts, um, supplemental procurement plans, if any, the trust fund utilization, among others. There's also the People's Budget Series that we in the DBM publish every year. Um, uh, this will be shown later um, in the details. And then the Seal of Good Local Governance, which is uh, mandated under Republic Act 11292, which provides awards, incentives, and um, honor to local governments who are able to to show that they uphold the transparency and accountability in the use of public funds, which is one of the criteria. And then also there's the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiatives, which provides a platform for dialogue or um, with key stakeholders. The next slide will show us that, let's move on to the next slide, yes. Um, this shows us Claire? I think that will last her, right? No, she's here. Okay. Hi, Claire, are you there? I just lost my connection. Yes, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Claire, we hear you. Yeah. Hi. Um, the first slide shows us that um, part of the BBM mandate is to publish the budget documents, which we do in a timely manner. We publish not only the enacted budget, um, let's refer to the previous slide, please. Not only the enacted budget for the year, but the budget priorities framework, the people's budget series, and national expenditure program, staffing summary, budget of expenditures and sources of financing technical notes on the current year's budget, post budget. As to the budget, Claire, I will listen you. Yes, I think I, I just got back. Thank you. I think my time is up. So there. I, I will give you 30 seconds more because of the, these technical difficulties. If you would like to just focus on the, the technical difficulties. The, all right. It's all Let's tool, go to the next. Uh, yeah. The next. Mm -hmm. um, the next slides will show us the fiscal transparency initiatives, which um, um, shows uh, we disclose or there is disclosure of amounts augmented and reallocated to fund priority programs and projects in response to COVID-19. There is the recently launched um, public portal on humanitarian assistance for the next slide. This was actually launched just this Monday. It is the primary government website for information, inquiries, and procedures on all local and foreign humanitarian assistance to the Philippine government, including in-kind and financial Okay, so I think uh, you're dropping, but uh, let's keep this for the questions because I think it's very interesting this platform that you're showing for a uh, humanitarian um, uh, aid uh, for, for COVID-19. So this platform is specifically for COVID-19. I think that one is very interesting. Um, we'll have a lot of time to, to ask you questions and then we can come back to this, to this platform. Maybe we can uh, share this specific link. Claire, if you could share on the chat the link to this uh, portal, then anyone can check it right now on their own uh, browsers, if you could do that. 
clear. Yes. I think yes, I will be, do that. Yes, yes, sure. I think that will be great so that everyone can see it right now and can start asking you questions about this. Yes. Uh, because this is All right. uh, very good. Sure, sure. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I will do that. All right, thank you. So, so let's check this out. Uh, I think some other countries are also doing things for platforms for COVID-19. And um, one important thing that reminds us always this, this issue with technology, and we're seeing it here. Sometimes we take it for granted that it's going to work, but it lets us, it reminds us that we should make our, our platforms light and easy to use for anyone. Um, Fernando, if you're ready, we would go all the way to Brazil to you. Okay. I am ready. Fortunately, not just the way, the way I wanted to, but I am ready. <laughs> I am sharing my screen, okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. But are you ready with a technical issue or I, should I pass Suki first? I have a, a technical issue, but uh, I, I think that that will won't be so in, uh, at this morning. I am going to present you my work around, unfortunately. Okay, okay. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay. I'm starting here my timer. Yes, five minutes. So, thank you for your... Thank you for this opportunity to show our product. Um, this is, uh, we have this, this website here, Cconf, where people can download data about uh, fiscal, fiscal issues for the three levels of government in Brazil, okay? This is uh, 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 a really not so good, way to download data. This is not a, a open data fashion uh, uh, website. This, there is this capture here. And so this is not an easy task to download data from, from the, the three levels of government about fiscal policies, fiscal reports. So we've developed uh, a solution that helps people to download this data, okay? I'm going to present you uh, a, a video, some parts of a video that uh, shows it, an older version of this product. We're, we're in, a, in, a, in a newer version uh, related to the, what I'm showing you, but I can, this can give you uh, 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 an opportunity to see what we're, we're working with, okay? This is a step-by-step a, a -step process where we help people to product their data or that they script to download the data, okay? In this first step, people can choose the, type, the, the report he wants to work with, okay? So uh, when, when we are here, we choose the report. And as you can see here, there is a script that is, is being built when we choose any one of these options. This is an R script that then the, uh, the person can copy to its own environment and run this script and then have the, the data he, will, he or she wants to work with. As I've said, this is a step-by-step. -step. The first step is to, to select the, the report. Then the next step is choose the year of the, the report. This by default is 2018. When you select the year here, you see the year is, is put in the, the script. I'm going ahead. This, the, on this step here, we choose the state of the expense, for example. Okay, we are, we are trying to, to work here with uh, expenses by function of government. We are going to retrieve the expenses of by uh, uh, by functions of government of some entities of the federal government. 
uh, I'm going to throw the steps here. We choose two functions of government, health and education, but there is also a, a huge list of uh, other functions of government to choose. Okay. Um, here we have the three levels of government. We choose here municipalities, but we can also choose the state and federal government. And here we choose Sao Paulo as one of these municipalities, and also Rio de Janeiro as the other uh, municipality. So we have here the script that brings the data from these municipalities. Okay, so you can copy to your own environment to, to load the data, as I'm, I'm going to, to show you right now. Okay, you, you will have the data on your environment. And you can also have the data available to browse it on our application, as you can see here. And as you can see here, you can also download it as a CSV or an Excel file, for example, and work right now, right after in your own environment. And for the last, we can see that we may produce some graphs just to show the a big shape of the a big picture of the data you are working with okay as i've said this is not the last latest version of our product it's much improved now but it's just what i i could find to to make the presentation right now uh i will send you later the the, the address where you can find the latest version and maybe we can talk a little bit more thank you Wow, so no music for Fernando since he had his own timer. <laughs> Fernando, thank you very much. So one of the very interesting things that you can see on Fernando's website, more than just uh, the graphs or if, if there's a new platform, you, you can see here that it's the integrated data of the national government and the subnational governments, including the municipalities that it's um more than five thousand right fernando yes more than five thousand so and the data is together in the same system and they're publishing it all together so that's a i i think that is a part of this great innovation um i i know that some of the the other governments that are here present or from civil society you've had a uh, challenges in getting data of national and subnational governments together so this is a a good example and we can uh, enter into details as well so yeah. finally for this block uh, we will have now we're going again to south africa why are we going again to south africa because um, this platform, Bulegamali, has been developed in a very, very close cooperation between the national treasury and civil society. So they do perceive this platform as a, as a collaborative platform. And, a, and Suki is going to show us another part of the platform that has to do with a procurement a, they you've had a long way on this so please suki go ahead all yours great thank you lorena and, and thanks um to prudence claire and and fernando for your presentations i'm quite keen for the conversation so i'll also try to time myself um, no worry, I'm timing you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. Um, I know, and you're very strict. And I have no excuses because I've I've had no um, technical difficulties. So I think I'll I'll get right into it. And and I and I think just to to share um, just how collaborative our process has been. This is off the same presentation that Prudence was sharing. Um, so we prepared this together, um, and the procurement. Um, aspect will be quite brief, but I, I decided I wasn't brave enough to do a live demonstration of Bulega Mali um, and instead just uh, copy pasted what I would have live demoed into the into the PowerPoint. Um, so the procurement 
for us, I think one of the objectives of uh, Vulega Mali was to empower research and researchers and advocacy uh, um, and you know civic actors in a sense, in addition to being able to empower um, parliamentarians and other oversight actors and the legislature. So it wasn't just about opening up data. So this was one objective for us that was quite important. The procurement aspect is something that we are still to develop further. So I'd, I'd really like to say at this point, please come back to us in two or three years time um, and let's see where we are on this. Um, but there were, I think as with any uh, project, compromises we had to make, but this was maybe an exciting compromise. We have a, a guide to procurement which looks at um, and as a resource, a learning resource that um, looks at breaking down quite a complex uh, process, quite a complex series of, of um, supply chain management and contracting processes for various reasons. We identified procurement as an important link to budget data and budget transparency um, because as in many uh, contexts, procurement very often is one, complicated, but on the other um, is also a space where a lot can be hidden because of its complexity. Um, and so for us, this was an important step towards opening up another element of, of um, the fiscus. So the guide, this is one example of a stage. It takes us from uh, planning stage to implementation stages. And at each stage, the guide breaks down what the key government planning uh, um, or key government legislation is, but also identifies opportunities for non-governmental actors to either provide a little bit of oversight or provides opportunities for people wanting to do or businesses wanting to do business with the state to better understand the whole process because that is another thing, um, lack of understanding about procurement requirements um, in our context. So each stage, um, then has uh, an overview which explains what the stage is. Um, it also has, um, gives examples and, and links to key, but key um, pr um, procurement data that is existent within our system or within the, the, and this in fact was developed in partnership with the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer in South Africa, um, which sits within the National Treasury. And I think quite importantly um, was this particular guide was spearheaded by a civil society in the sense that its um, framing and, um, and overall work was, was um, structured that way. I think what's also valuable about it is that it, it highlights weaknesses within the system, which either um, identifies areas that are maybe problematic, but also areas that might be beneficial for a little bit of advocacy um, by, by actors or by officials themselves. Um, so those, yeah, the various stages. And so why is this for us quite an exciting achievement? Really, I think perhaps to say in our context, the last two years or so, well, longer than that, has been quite a difficult context for South African democracy. Um, the, the, the term state capture is quite big in our lexicon at the moment. And the issue of private um, entities or interests capturing the state has been quite major. And so this for us is a tool that was identified by one of the leading um, uh, investigative journalist entities in our country who was at the center of exposing state capture, major state capture issues and procurement in particular. So for us, them listing our tool as a key learning resource and a key tool within their own arsenal is quite important and, and very exciting and has helped us to achieve our, our, our objective in this regard. Thank you. So an Oscar for for Suki as well. <laughs> yeah, so Bule Kamali has been uh, very exciting to us, as you can see. When uh, you have the same presentation for government and civil society. And they plan a presentation together when at the same time they are telling you that it's a hard and difficult uh, political context. I think it uh, shows how to move when the agenda is allows it. And uh, well, I think this is a great tool. So now you all have a chance to make questions. So 
please raise your hands. If no one raises the, your, their hands, I can go ahead because I have a lot of questions. Okay. Okay, Gustavo. Uh, hello. Uh, I want to ask to Fernando, uh, how do they ensure that the data from the local governments is the official one or where did they, they look for the for the data? I don't understand this. Uh, sorry, I, I, I think I, I didn't get the, the question. How I make sure how the data, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat it, please? Uh, I understand that you are showing uh, data from federal governments or local governments too. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if. if the Brazilian government published all of the data in the same site. Uh, as we in Argentina, we don't have the local government's data. I am asking myself if, uh, if in Brazil is, uh, is, a, is a place that have all the data or, or if you are going to, to look for the data in different places. Okay. No, no. The, uh, good question. Thank you for your question. We we collect the data the sub go, the sub level sub government level no the sub the sub national level. Mm -hmm. They inform us the data. We have a, a, such a, some tools to collect this data, and we then put it all together on the site and see confi. But we this is a, a, a trustful relation. We, we must have to trust the data the, the entities uh, give us give to us. We have some kind of uh, uh, routines to check the data, but most generally we just trust the data they, they send to us. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Fernando, as, as far as I remember, this uh, the, the tool was already there, but then uh, the um, the municipalities started not so long ago reporting on this system more information, right? Right. Yes. The, the municipalities are, are, are uh, is more recently that they are representing the information to us. The states and the federal government is a, a bit longer. The, 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 we pr they provided the information. So, yeah. So that's also part of what I find interesting. This uh, uh, system has increased the coverage um it's and uh, not very long ago um okay so any other hands i i have the same questions for for the for claire how are you getting the data for humanitarian uh, where where is the data coming from for your portal the data is actually the portal is actually um um what do you call that? The, the owner of the portal is the Department of Foreign Affairs. So they are the one that manages the portal. Um, um, it is managed actually by an interagency team composed of the Department of Information and Communications Technology, the Department of National Defense, Office of Civil Defense, and the Department of Foreign Affairs. So it's through the DFA or the, the Foreign Affairs where we get the data, especially the um, donations from other countries. And through the Office of Civil Defense, they have the the information that they they <clears throat> populate into the data. Great. And um, this data is downloadable in Open Data. Um, I'm not really quite sure yet, as it was just launched last Monday. But <laughs> um, I will try to ask and um, share with you whatever they say about 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 it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's hope that they are. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's hope that they are. Indeed. Okay, so Ganchimek from, from Mongolia, um, she is asking, she wants to know the shorter frequency to feed budget data in the context of timely. So is it weekly, monthly, 
actual execution of the budget for institution uh, for each institution institution such as school so i think this is different for our presenters so i can ask each of them to tell us what is the frequency of um of feeding the budget and spending data on the website so i can we can start with uh, prudence um, for us, the national budget data we upload yearly uh, for the in-year quarterly reporting that is per quarter and for the adjustments are done once a year except for this year when we had to have a COVID-19 page, um, but it's usually just doing adjustments once a year too. So the frequency depends on what is our obligations also legally. So if it's a quarterly report, we'll have to also upload it on the portal quarterly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in the case of uh, Fernando. Sorry. Uh, what is it, the frequency of publication of, of updating the data? Okay, sorry, I was trying to solve the problem. Okay, the frequency we have for the data we are, we are working with right now we have a range from uh, uh, after each two months okay but you have also for a, a, a each quarter of the week the year and also for and also yearly it it depends on the data we are working with okay but the the most frequent one is uh, uh for each two months we are updating our data and for your case, Claire, the expenditure data, let's not think about the aid data right now because that's uh, the other platform. So, or, or if you know how frequently they're going to update the aid data, that's also welcome. Okay. Um, I'm actually trying to look at the website now and, and checking it, how they are presenting the data. We just spend for, I think it's the, it depends if the information is um, provided in the different website and actually the data from the different agencies permit. This will also um, send to Congress as a report. Sorry, sorry, Claire. I think, um, yeah, we're having a, a problems with your audio. Can you say again, were you saying that it's uh, updated by different ministries? Yes, um, with respect to expenditure on the budget or funds for, for COVID-19 efforts, these um, um, are given to the Department of Budget Management are submitted and then this is um, consolidated for showing to the Office of the President and to Congress as well. Thank so you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. And uh, yesterday we had I, I showed you before the the presentations from yesterday. So I'm glad. I think we still have here Gustavo Merino. They update the data daily. Um, the transactions daily connected to their systems. So. So that part of notifications that you saw that then you can get a daily notification of what's going on with the budget. So this varies a lot on the frequency on what you, uh, on how often you're getting the data and also of course the systems and form of gathering data. And now we have a question from Fabricio. Fabricio, all yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I don't have my camera. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, um, thank you very much. And Fernando, I, was, I have a question for you. I, I mean, it's great work what you have been doing over there. Um, I'm very uh, burdensome and very um, difficult. I was wondering what is the most common challenge you are facing with uh, data coming from subnational governments or municipal governments in Brazil? And if there is or, or if there are other entities uh, in the government that could hold this data or could help you to improve the quality of data to national governments, um, yes, that would be my question. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you, Fabrice. It's good to see you. Oh, it's a long time since we've, we've seen. <laughs> we, uh, we have some work together. We presented a, a, an event two years or three, four years, five years ago. So, yes, very uh, young. Yes. <laughs> we, yes, in fact, we, we have the, 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 how can I say this in English? Tem algum brasileiro? Aqui, Tribunal de Contas. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the cult of account, let's, let's say this. The cult of account of the states, they help the to... Yeah. Yes, they help to, to validate the, the data, okay? Uh, this is the, the maybe the, I think this is the first interface that the data is, is analyzed and then this data is published. Okay, um, uh, you, you're, you're asking if, if what are the issues of okay, Fabrizio, what are the issues of the, the municipalities? You ask this, okay? Yes, what are the, the most common challenges you are facing with that kind of yes. data? Okay, yes, the, the most common challenge is, is really to validate the data because uh, some, some, some uh, reports we note that, uh, have noticed that it's clearly the data is not fair, okay? It's some mistake, it's maybe it's some, some difficult to, to the municipality to produce the, the, a good data, okay? Uh, right now, we are improving the, the mechanisms to, 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 get a, to build a better data. We are using an XBRL approach that helps to, to, to prove the data, uh, to, to clarify the data. And then with this, the, this issue, with this tool, we send feedbacks to the municipalities uh, and to help to guide the, the municipalities to, to fix the data. But this, this is, I think this is the, the most important challenge. I don't work with this, this process directly. I, I work as a, a consumer of the data, but uh, I guess this is the, the, the most important challenge. Excellent. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's a very big challenge and I, I see that you're tackling. I think we have seen this problem with consolidation. We have seen it in the USA spending treasury platform. We have seen it in, in Mexico and I don't know, in uni money from, from South Africa, if you, if you know of challenges in, in getting that data and the quality of the data, I see Suki saying yes. <laughs> and in, in Mexico, Fabricio, also, if you're interested, they have a um, quality of data index to measure what the municipalities report on expenditure. So more or less what Fernando is saying, how do you check on the quality of the data of subnational governments, which is quite a challenge. And now we go to Omar, Omar, who has a question as well. Please, Omar. I can't hear you, Omar. Are you speaking? Can you hear me now? There, there you go. Okay, thank you. Sorry, so hello everyone. So my question is uh, for the three countries. I would like to learn uh, what is the level of detail of the data published for the national level, so how disaggregated it is, how many categories you can find. And if, uh, if it is not the most disaggregated level, the one that is published, are there plans to disaggregate it or are there legal barriers to, to do it? Thank you. For that one, we can have, um, can, can we start with a prudence? You just Clarify on the segregated part. Is are you talking about a specific um, sector desegregation, economic classification? So in general, you would have the most aggregate level, right? Like perhaps uh, 10, 20, 30 categories uh, of uh, expenditure, and then you can go down into different categories depending on the administrative classification or the functional, etc. So I, we just want to learn how down in detail, in disaggregation, uh, I could find the data. 
Oh, okay, okay, I understand. I think for for the main budget, we just do it up to economic classification level four, which is just um, the high level where it will tell you that this is a transfer and it, sh it shows you the transfer line to say this is going to a province or local government grant. Um, if it's goods and services, it will show you also just high level consultations or um, compensation of employees so it doesn't go to the low 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 level for their bigger budgets but for the in-year data on the other hand you can go as low as you like to see the information uh, depending on what you would like to see because that one it has more details because it's for in-year monitoring thank you yeah, yeah, like Ghana, uh, Ghana, now that you were mentioning, yes, this question is very close to what you're asking, but also Suki was mentioning that uh, they present, no, sorry, that was in prudence in infrastructure data that they're presenting also all the way to the school level. I also timed myself and I have my music now as well. So, <laughs> So you can see different levels of disaggregation. I think we would like to come back to this uh, question of the disaggregation of the data because it's an interesting thing. Uh, please, if you can share about the, in the level of disaggregation that you're going through in the classifications in the chat. Um, if you would like to make precisions, uh, Suki Prudence on the state-owned enterprises and uh, the subnational governments, same for clear. If you could write down on the chat your level of disaggregation and if uh, your data includes um, subnational governments as well and state-owned enterprises. So now we're going, for, for the sake of time and that we have time for all the blogs, we're now going to our next uh, presentation. Thank you very much for answering these questions. I think that we now have more questions than when we started, instead of having less, but uh, that's, that's how it goes. So now we're going with Enrique Zapata for our next block of the sessions. And Enrique is gonna talk about the GovTech environment. Uh, Enrique, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, I was saying thank you, uh, Lorena, Juan Pablo, and everything in, in GIF for um, having me and Gaf in this meeting. I'm going to share my screen in a second. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to. So, I mean, we, we've been talking about data and how to validate, as Fernando was saying, uh, visualizations uh, such as ones presented by Prudence, um, APIs, functionalities in, in different products, so, so to speak. Um, what I wanted to present here. Uh, is, is GovTech as a governance strategy, as a mechanism in which uh, we can work towards having um, these data and development ca capacities and capabilities inside government in a sustained and efficient uh, way uh, in, in across time. So just to be very specific about what we mean by GovTech, GovTech is Precisely this, an ecosystem in which governments work with a very particular actor, which is startups and SMEs, which are data intensive and with very concrete digital expertise, particularly in exponential technologies, to solve public problems. The reason why we from the Development Bank in Latin America see GovTech as um, an interesting space to work in is because, well, first, it's a 400 billion uh, market uh, globally. Uh, and annually, but it's because uh, we see that it has uh, or supports high value added economic sectors while promoting digital transformations in governments as a whole, but also in very specific institutions. It can create economic output in the economy in general, but also create social impact. And uh, most importantly for the conversation that we're having today is this, it's a strategy that does not aim to create something new in government because we have a lot of things to do in government, but it's actually a strategy that aims to connect uh, diverse initiatives and diverse team and diverse areas of work in digital uh, data, open government, entrepreneurship, and other 
um, sectors in government that tend to work in parallel, not necessarily connected. And in this way, we see that we can create and potentialize uh, these efforts. To make sure I really understand what the GovTech system looked like, we developed the GovTech Index 2020. It's the first global measurement um, of the GovTech ecosystem that uh, has ever been made, and it's composed of 28 indicators, comprised in seven pillars and then uh, in seven dimensions, sorry, and then in three pillars. Um, and, and basically, the, the index is, is, is the, the one you see here. It's only for uh, Iberoamerica right now, which is Latin America plus Spain and Portugal, because uh, those are the members of, of the world. But the methodology is open, and it can be replicated quite easily for other parts of the world. And the important thing is this. And this is the model that uh, we created for the GovTech ecosystem. And uh, important for this is that in government, we see that we need to uh, create or to appoint GovTech teams uh, and, and high level political commitments to really create this new ecosystem in which we can to foster the capacities and capabilities inside government, uh, along with some laws and regulations to oper operationalize uh, these kind of ecosystems and laws particularly pertaining to, to public procurement, which I'm gonna talk about in a second and also align different uh, funding streams that we have in government, not only for your own areas, but also for uh, the support of uh, civil society and private sector SMEs uh, outside government. From the part of startups, and startups do, for, for us, we don't, don't only um, see startups as private businesses, but also some civil society and some academia that tend to uh, be suppliers of governments uh, at some points we see the need of greater coordination spaces specifically to amplify the voice and the way that the sector as a whole relates to government to have more negotiation power to promote better b2g skills uh, and specifically uh, on how to talk and how to relate to government officials for data and procurement and uh, to promote venture capital uh, to, to support these SMEs and as a connecting connecting vessel in, for these two actors, we have data, specifically open data, which is, as, as you know, the basic input for uh, all digital technologies and solutions today, and pro public procurement um, frameworks and, and culture inside government. Uh, just to end, to say that from, from GAF, we recently launched our GovTech Lab, which is comprised of these six um, products and services. Uh, today, I briefly talk only about the index and the governance framework that we created, but we are going to launch a regional report uh, in, in September or October uh, this year and observatory to really pinpoint where these, these startups are in Latin America, Spain and Portugal to know uh, their economic, economic output, output, how many jobs they're creating and to really create uh, potentially a marketplace in which supply and demand can meet. We, we launched in 2021 an investment program for these uh, startups, the first investment program for GovTech in Latin America. And we are uh, greatly working with governments at the national, state, and municipal level to create innovation labs and to really support governments in understanding and measuring in greater depth what GovTech means for them and how they can use this strategy uh, to, to develop the, the tools on these tips, uh, such as the one you were talking about. Finally, uh, I will leave you here my, my email and I'm open for uh, any question or any comment you can have and to work with you uh, in, in really implementing GovTech as a strategy for fiscal transparency in our uh, countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrique. I, I, I really, um, he has, they have been showing us this GovTech, uh, new, new forms of seeing this development of technology. Uh, so I am very glad that we have the, the right people around the room uh, for this to happen. I hope uh, you get in touch with Enrique if you have any questions. Uh, and these innovation labs for me sound very interesting. Right now, I'm going to skip to Felipe, the OECD. Thank you, Felipe, for being here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, I'll share my screen, and I would appreciate if you can confirm that you can you can see it. Um, just give me one second. 
So, can you see it? Can you see my presentation or? There we go, yes. yes. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for us. It's a pleasure uh, to join you today. Um, our colleagues from GIFT and many other countries. So um, the idea today as the invitation was to discuss also about some tools and, and, and practices, I think um, one, of the, one of the key issues that I've, I've heard in the conversations right now, you know, like especially in the last presentation, is about the quality of data and, and what are the measures and the principles that can be taken into account to ensure that the data the, that we are um, opening up, sharing and reducing its, its of quality. So for, for, for us, it's, it's a pleasure to, to join today and talk a bit about the work we do on, on data transparency and data driven, driven public sector. So um, well, definitely it's not new that uh, data becomes valuable when, when the data sets are shared and uh, opened up and reused. But uh, to enable a data driven public sector, uh, the quality and the consistency of the data is one of the basic elements to take into account. And uh, for this reason, data quality should be considered um, at the core of the design and implementation of financial uh, management information systems or any other related uh, um, digital system or, or tool. Good data and the infrastructure uh, needed to share it inside and outside the public sector are fundamental for timely and reliable fiscal functions, such as planning, cash transfers, or auditing. But it's also critical for transparency uh, and trustworthiness in fiscal activities. And what we've seen in COVID-19, and here the colleagues from GIFT have led uh, really interesting work, is that government needs to react fast uh, but also have the right, provide the right mechanisms so communities can uh, make government accountable. So then here, the balance between integrity and agility cannot work separately anymore. So we need to work hand in hand in having good data and having, you know, like fast, quick access to that, to that data too. And uh, you share it already, also from my previous um, public servant experience, most of the frictions in opening up data or in, in, in using this data in general, but specifically fiscal data relate to uh, the need to ensure the quality prior to be disclosed. And, and that takes us a lot of time uh, and uh, discussions and uh, green lights inside our different uh, ministries of finance and, and related agencies. So then data governance uh, principles uh, need to be embedded across the whole financial management uh, process. And for this, it's that uh, I wanted to share with you a bit the work we are doing on data governance and, uh, and particularly the, our data governance framework. When bringing this to the fiscal data governance uh, domain, we see that it's fundamental to ensure timely, reliable and coherent data across um, public, public financial management activities and in particular to enable fiscal transparency. So um, our work on open data and data driven public sector have been focusing for, for, for a while on the reuse and the strategies and the governance of these initiatives. Now we are also step, like taking one step back and also having a look at the quality of the data and um, how relevant are the different systems in place to ensure that the data we are using uh, it's, it's um, of a good quality level and also uh, the ethical framework that we use, we have in place to ensure that the data is used uh, in the right way. Uh, and here I'm not going to go into the details because I'm sharing the link here of the of the specific report that we, we wrote on this, uh, but there are a series of elements that go from the more political level to the more uh, tactical and operational level that need to be taken into account when, when uh, designing and implementing in the context of our conversation um, um, fiscal um, financial management information systems. So then just to try to um, finalize the conversation, I'll be quick. Um, this requires the ministries of finance to, to develop capacities to ensure that the data is uh, um, uh, to ensure timely and quality access to the data. Uh, that, for example, will enable accurate and reliable information for decision making, monitoring uh, and other transparency related initiatives. Um, and given the complexity of financial management and the large number of stakeholders, uh, it's important uh, uh, 
that governments take um, a collaborative approach to develop these uh, data governance frameworks uh, to be open, inclusive, and, uh, and uh, as collaborative as possible. Because in the end, you know, like the data needs and 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 the and the view of the related stakeholders is critical to ensure that that the data will be of quality and will be useful. I'll be really quick. So give me one <laughs> give me one minute and we'll finish. Um, so uh, I think also ministries of finance and, and budget agencies can can uh, support um, promoting a data driven culture um, that um, equip teams and uh, with uh, uh, with the right skills and the right um, um, infrastructure to open up and integrate these these uh, systems. And here I think it's a really interesting point since we need to ensure the uh, horizontal integrity of the data. I see one of the trends that um, uh, that we observe in some of the countries is the integration of different uh, financial related information systems. Also, for example, integrating at transactional level uh, with procurement systems, with uh, tax systems, uh, payroll and many others in order to ensure that at the transactional level, the granular level, then the quality is full. It's, it's, it, it's of really good uh, uh, quality. And, uh, and this, of course, in the context of a data governance uh, framework, then I think this is the effort to open up, to integrate and to reuse, to reuse the data. So um, just to share with you two of the reports that basically uh, drive this conversation and uh, some of the, the work that we are doing. Uh, we'll soon be launching the Digital Government Index. It is the first uh, OECD uh, benchmarking tool uh, on multiple digital government domains, and including one on data-driven public sector, which uh, it would have been really interesting to share with you. Uh, with some really interesting insights on, on how countries are addressing data governance from a central federal point of view. But of course, there are lessons that can be drawn to the um, financial uh, management level. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, happy to answer your, your questions if you have. Thank you, Felipe. Sorry to cut you off like this because we really want to see all the presentations and don't want the next one to run. Uh, we do want to make a lot of questions about this uh, data governance. Uh, here is also Daniel Cerebro on Friday. We're having a session on modernizing financial management information systems. That has a lot to do with this, so please connect to that one as well. Uh, we're also talking about uh, gathering quality data. Thank you very much, Felipe. This is uh, uh, the work they're doing on data ethics and how to use data. Is, it's really great. Uh, so I really wanted to have them here because of that. Uh, thank you, Felipe. And now we have our last presentation before we go to questions. So Omar, so now this is a perspective of a user of the data. Yes, thank you, Lorna. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So indeed, I am on the other end of the spectrum. So I'm a user, uh, an academic, and I'm trying to build tools. Can you see my screen? So my screen, sorry. Yeah, you can click on share as well. Perfect. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, um, I'm trying to build tools to help uh, governments uh, um, you exploiting their uh, very unique data, really amazing data, like the one that many of you are producing. So in this particular case, I will show how a tool that we have developed with my colleague Gonzalo Castañeda from Mexico to connect um, expenditure data with indicators, with development indicators, and in particular in this context with indicators from the SDGs. So the tool that we created a while ago is called, we call it policy priority inference. And it is basically an agent-based model. If you're not familiar with this term, it's basically a simulation like a video game so you have artificial agents, you have an agent that represents the central authority that allocates the resources, you have other agents that are the policymakers. So with this agent-based model, we try to link spending, policymaking, and indicators. So we try to map the process and how spending in certain topics help you improve the indicators. Uh, two features that are salient is that it takes into account some institutional factors like the rule of law and behavioral attributes as well about how ministries learn to be more efficient or less efficient. 
And it also takes into account this network of interlinkages that are that is frequently talked about in the SDG community. So you can provide the, the model uh, a matrix with the interdependencies between your indicators. And in this particular application, what we use is, uh, we're gonna use very aggregate data, so only the total amount of expenditure. What we're interested here is in the heterogeneity of budget sizes across countries and how different countries can be sensitive to changes in those budgets. So we're gonna use this very aggregate data in the World Bank. Later I can talk about how uh, we can use more disaggregate data. Uh, we cover 79 indicators from the latest Sustainable Development Report. This is not the UN one, this is the one that comes from the Sustainable Development Network Solutions. Uh, 145 countries divided in these regions. Uh, we just changed the, obviously the, the cluster of OECD for West because we took out some countries and put them back in the regions like Mexico, Japan, Chile, which made more sense for some uh, imputation data procedures. And here's an example of the kind of outputs that, that uh, we get. So this is, we run these estimations. What we want to do is to measure the, the factibility, the feasibility of reaching the SDGs. And reaching the SDGs means reaching the specific values for these indicators that are set in the sustainable development report. We want to measure the number of years that it will take starting from today, from 2020. So we calibrate the model with this historical data set and then we run forward simulations to estimate those times. So we do that for every country and I'm presenting you here some aggregates. I'm happy to share this because this might be very uh, small. I don't know if it looks too small in your screens, but in general, these are histograms just plotted in a circle layout. And the, the, the height of the bar indicates how many years it takes to reach an indicator. And overall, what you would see is that, for example, for the African region, it would take approximately 30 years. Uh, to reach those goals, while for the West it will take 20 years, which is still not amazing. And I'm going to just move over quickly to what is more interesting, uh, which has to do with, okay, knowing that it will take us not 10 years, but 20 or 30 years to reach, on average, these indicators. Um, what happens if we change the budgets? So we simulate this, and these are lines for each individual country that tells you, okay, if you shrink the budget, if you move to the left, you're gonna be delayed this number of years. And you, you can see that the more you shrink the budget, obviously the, the delays become worse and worse. And on the right side is how much you can save in time, how many years you can save if you increase the budget. And an interesting thing here, obviously first there is heterogeneity across countries on how sensitive they are to these changes, but you can explore these areas of more or less realistic growth in the budgets, for example, uh, from one decade to another. But also you can see perhaps adverse situations like COVID scenarios in which we know that some countries might not be able to spend in the same way they have been doing. And these even might be a bit optimistic because there are other consequences from COVID. For example, the gap from the initial indicators of 2020 until 2030 might have uh, now increased because uh, of the pandemic. We can aggregate these lines into the different regions that I presented to you that clusters and see, for example, that some some clusters like the West are less sensitive to budgetary changes than Africa. And this is because there, are, there is more uh, infrastructure in place than, um, than other regions. But um, in general, what you can see is that the way we model uh, the budget here is that it affects you in the short term. So these are short term scenarios. So you can keep increasing the budget and you're gonna reach a limit. And we call this the budgetary frontier. And this is a very interesting thing because it tells us the shortcomings of short-term allocations. Uh, for the long-term, you have to address more structural issues. And with that, I, I end my presentation. And if you want to learn more about the tool, here's this website where you will find some reports, academic papers, and some uh, infographics uh, and videos as well. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. And I almost didn't have a, the, the Oscars music for you. Um, this is a great practice. We're going to be in the data for policy um, summit in a couple of weeks. And Omar is going to be presenting this paper. We're going to have a, a panel there. And he will only have five minutes to present as well. So this is also a good practice. So uh, open for questions. We have to be very strategic on the questions please uh, right now and please keep the contact details of of the presenters because we have 
the session of evaluating fiscal transparency in half hour. So that's why I need to keep a, a track of time. Uh, unfortunately, we have some technical difficulties. Um, questions now. I see uh, from Suki, for Enrique and Felipe, where do you place public participation and public-private partnership in your priority ranking? Shall I go first? Um, yeah, go thanks for your question. Um, I would say very high indeed, uh, both in terms of how decisions are taken, but also on uh, what outputs and outcome, outcomes are produced. Um, a, a, a really important part of the work that at least we, we promote from the, uh, through the, um, our uh, open data index, uh, it's that data needs to be reduced and then should reflect the needs of users and, uh, and should be also useful for the ones that finally uh, need to, need to are, are, you know, like innovating with, with, with the data and also for the people that are uh, making the government accountable. So in that sense, uh, open data initiative should, should definitely include uh, the, the needs of users. Now from the, from the data driven public sector approach, uh, I think there is an important element on transparency of decisions, uh, frameworks and infrastructure. Uh, and there is a, um, a really important discussion that we didn't, we didn't address today, but on uh, the ethical use of data and, and uh, bias, for example, in algorithms or decision making. And for, for in order to advance in the use of, in, in the data driven approach, um, on, for example, fiscal data, uh, the way that data is used and the framework that are implemented need to be also transparent for, for the user. So I would say that it, that's, that the, the uh, participation of related stakeholders is it's an extremely element to be to to be taken into account. Yeah, and, and from my side, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Felipe has just said. I mean, they, in, in my ranking, they are very high indeed. Um, I would say that participation, understood that civic participation is uh, quite relevant, specifically because we're talking about uh, fiscal transparency and accountability. And both transparency and, and, and accountability uh, can't exist uh, without civil society or civic participation uh, being in the equation. Uh, what I would say about public-private partnerships, specifically the ones that I was talking about with, with startups, is that in, in the world that we are currently living in, uh, thinking about governments with millions of things to do and extreme budgetary pressures, um, taking on the capacities, capabilities, flexibility, agility, and innovation that startups and private sector can have and bringing them in gov into government when you need it uh, will increasingly be important to develop the initiatives uh, um, that, that we are talking about in, in the way that we are talking about. Um, and lastly, I would end by saying that I am only talking about issues of transparency and accountability. If you would change the sector in which we're talking about, for example, economic development, I would tend to modify that ranking and say that public private partnerships uh, would be higher. So let's just not uh, generalize and, and, and talk specifically about this. Yeah. Excellent. Um... I saw here some other questions, but I don't know if I'm missing any. I see one on um, the enabling policies, legislation, cultures of co-production between government and non-government actors within the GovTech initiatives. Sorry, technical problems. Um, Yes, th th that's a very good question. And, and, and again, I'm going to talk about specifically uh, the sector that we are working, which is transparency. And transparency tend to be very, uh, very civic focused. What I would, and, and we have laws and regulations that pertain to that part of things. But really when you work in government, what you would be wishing to do is to use transparency and accountability for other policy objectives, which is having a more efficient government. And efficient, it means that 
we use our budgets, but also in the way that we communicate how those budgets, budgets are being used. So we from the GovTech Index and GAF see a lot of opportunity of updating existing laws and existing regulations uh, to um, kind of show this new way of viewing how the civic space relates to um, the development of new technological tools. And uh, the, 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 the other idea that, that I would say is that many of the laws and regulations that we have do not, um, ca cannot embed the way that they see reality with, with the way that technological tools and, and solutions evolve. So we need to also start thinking in the way of making these laws and regulations more flexible to enable us and specifically you in government to change and update them as technology and the needs of society and expectations of society evolve, which is a big challenge everywhere. Thank you, Enrique. And uh, finally, if um, I don't see any hands up, I would really like I, Omar to just mention very quickly how you're using the, the budget data and how you're getting the, the data, because this is a Thing we're working on with him as well with the open fiscal so please Omar. Yes uh, sure Lorena so the um, in this particular study I mean it's a very aggregate data set so it's just like a lump sum but in other we have another version of this where actually we take very disaggregate data so you have hundreds of categories of expenditure programs and uh, in the case of Mexico, well, you know, well, uh, they are linked to specific indicators as well. So you can actually then try to calibrate the model so that your agents generate this observed distribution of resources across all these expenditure programs. And they are linked to the indicators. So you can say you have a strong case of a causal story of what is driving your indicators from the side of expenditure, if that makes sense. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, of course, expenditures does not all uh, completely uh, give us the idea of why development is working the way it is, but it does give us an idea and is one of the variables that they're using. And I, I, I think this is very interesting. They're using the data we're publishing with the open fiscal data package. Uh, so uh, many of the government here represented are working on budgeting for SDGs and at the same time on opening data and in program budgeting. So if we mix this all together, we can make a great use of data models to improve policy making. So that's the bottom line of this. Okay, so given that we are uh, going to the next session because we hope to see you there on evaluating fiscal transparency, and I want to thank you all the, to the presenters here. Uh, I am speaking also to, to Felipe that probably we can have a complete presentation on the Our Data Index some of these days because that is a, also a, an interesting approach. Uh, thank you to um, Claire, to Prudence, Suki, um, I see. Enrique, then Fer Fernando, Felipe, Omar, thank you all for presenting here today. And see you in half an hour or 20 minutes. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you. Thanks for inviting. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.